All right, let's open up our Bibles to Esther chapter 8 tonight. Esther chapter 8. So last time we were together, last Wednesday, we took a look at how God was moving and ensuring that his people were being taken care of. We kind of looked at last week's study as a turning point in the book of Esther. As we've seen prior to that, that Haman was devising a plan to take down the Jews uh, because of his hatred, basically, for Mordecai. He decided to go ahead and take down all the Jews and make a decree uh, with the king's signet ring and send it out throughout the land to say, hey, on this particular day, we're going to annihilate the Jews. <clears throat> Mordecai, uh, working with Esther, uh, put together a plan, told Esther, hey, for such a time as this, you were, you were created to be here. You're created and now become a queen of Persia, and it's going to be on your hands to be able to deliver your people because you're in that powerful status that you have to be able to use it because since God gave it to you. And so last week, we seen Haman going from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, as he crumbled in power, as his plan was uh, uncovered, as Esther told the king of Haman's plan to annihilate the Jews, he was done hung from the own, his own gallows that he built for Mordecai. And then we see Mordecai, and we're going to see that today in chapter 8, we'll see Mordecai going from a low position being ran out as a rebel, basically, as a a Jew, as Haman was hunting him down, he's going to be raised to the second highest place in Persia, taking Haman's spot. It's funny how God can turn these things around. And, you know, and I'm pretty sure we all have our own individual testimonies of how God has turned things around in our own lives that we didn't think could be turned around. So God is constantly watching. He's constantly guiding his people protecting his people here in the book of Esther, he does the same for us. If it looks like there's no way out, just just wait a little bit longer. God's going to provide a way. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1, chapter 8. We're going to see here that Esther saves the Jews. It says, On that day, King of Sources gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. Think of how hard Haman probably worked to achieve everything that he had, the status that he had, the prime minister of Persia. All the hard work that he put in, yet it was all for nothing as we read through the scripture today. In chapter 7, we see he, he is hanged and he dies with nothing to show. That's a pretty sad thing to see a man waste his life like that. Haman, this disturbed man, has seemingly achieved everything. He had status, he had wealth. He had respect, whether it was forced or not, he had it. He had a family, he had friends we've seen here that he was talking about. And it seemed like he had climbed the ladder of success pretty good, but the only problem, that ladder was on the wrong building. And that building crumbled beneath him. It says there in verse 8 that King Esther, uh, Queen Esther received the house of Haman, probably for telling the king his plans and what have you. Then we see that Esther ends up giving Mordecai Haman's house, taking over the enemy of the Jews' own home and possessions. The Lord delivered that to him. But many people like Haman like to climb the ladder of success. They want to gain all the prestige that comes with success and the wealth uh, that comes with success. But too often we've seen them fall in the news media from the pulpit, from 
you name it, they have fallen. Even here in our local community, we've seen people falling from the graces of society. And so did Haman fall here too. The entire goal of a lot of people's climb on that ladder to success is self-gratification, self-promotion, all about me, 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 the pride. And we know who else fell from a very long way with pride, and that was Satan himself. And that's the same thing that plagues humanity today, is the pride of a person. And when we fall from pride, we, we, we know that it ultimately hurts very bad. And as believers, we must never neglect the blessings that God has given us, no matter how big or how small. The simple fact that we have breath in our lungs is enough to praise God, because we don't necessarily deserve that. But he still sees fit to give us that breath. God has given us everything that we have, and we should never forget that. And Haman, he should have lived his life for God. He should have turned to God at some point, but he decided to have pride in his life. And we look at Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. We see Solomon, who carefully considered a lot of things in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, as he was starting to get towards the end of his life and seeing the things that were important and what was not important. So Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So what men ultimately should do is fear God and keep his commandments. What does it tell us in Matthew? Seek the kingdom of God first, then everything else will come. So our whole, our whole, what our whole agenda should be in our life is to seek after God in his heart. God will provide everything else for us. And we see as the Jews and Mordecai and Esther as the Jewish nation here began to seek after God. And God blessed them with, uh, which we're going to see as survival of a nation. Um, as they fasted before God, uh, I'm sure they probably prayed before God, what have you. But whenever we seek out God, that is our ultimate goal in life. And as believers, the work we do should, should always be towards the Lord. It should never be for our own selfish gains or ambitions. We should forget self and always be doing our work for God. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is in vain if it is not for the Lord. If you're doing any kind of labor for any other motive than to work before God, your labor is going to be in vain. We should always do our work as though we're doing it towards God, regardless if it's our job that brings in an income, if we're leading our families, if we're being a good friend to somebody. It should always be with the attitude, I'm doing this for the Lord first, that everything else would become secondary. <clears throat> Now, Haman used to be the second in command in the kingdom, and now we see Mordecai receiving the signet ring, uh, station, uh, solidifying his position now as basically the prime minister of Persia. And this signet ring was very important because if that signet ring was used on any kind of document, any kind of letter, anything uh, of any good, any kind of decrees, any kind of policies, laws, that was a sign that the king had approved this. And so this was a very important role and a very, could possibly be stressful role for Mordecai because he was representing the king. And that signet ring was an approval of the king. And the approval for us is being sealed with the Holy Spirit. That is the signet ring of God, to be sealed and kept by the Holy Spirit for the work of God and be having the approval of the king of kings. So now we see Esther finally revealed to uh, King of Sources who Mordecai was 
that he had raised her as a young girl and that he, she, he was a relative and he is now placed into second in command in Persia. <clears throat> Verses three, as we continue, says, Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with the tears to com- uh, counteract the evil of Haman, the Agite, and the scheme which he had advised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seem right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters advised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews <clears throat> who are in the king's province. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? So Esther asked that the previous decree that was put out by Haman to be torn up and to be thrown out because that was the decree that was going to destroy the Jews on the day that it was appointed to. Yet, if you remember back in uh, Esther chapter 5, she didn't ask him that when he first, she first approached him. We remember she asked that him and Haman would come to a banquet. Matter of fact, two banquets. And we, we thought maybe she was getting cold feet in asking the king about this. But we learned that God had a certain timing for this. God was setting up Esther to win and to protect the Jews and deliver the Jews. There was a certain time and place that this needed to take place. And here we've we seen her ask at, at the second banquet for that request to be able to save the Jews and unfolding the plan that Haman had to kill the Jews at that particular point. Now the problem with this decree, she's asking King of Sources to be able to <clears throat> tear this decree up. Just get rid of the law, you're the king. But the problem is that the Medes and Persians uh, in their type of monarchy is, is that the king had to obey the law of the land. He couldn't just come up with rules and get rid of rules. There was a certain, kind of like today, we have our constitution that, that governs us, which I hope continues to govern us. Um, so there were certain things that we have freedoms to do and certain laws that are put into place that just a president just can't change, right? So kind of along those same lines. So one of the laws was that if a law was made with the, Medi- the Medes and the Persians, It said that once a law was established, it could not be reversed, not even by the king. So Esther is asking this probably with a little bit of ignorance, not knowing that that was the law of the land, asking the king to take down this decree. And she's going to find out that this decree cannot be moved because of the laws that are set up there. This is the same reason that King Darius in in Daniel uh, 6 didn't want him to go into the lion's den. So, but he couldn't change that fact because he had already written the decree for it to happen. So he couldn't make that change. So how could God's people be preserved with a decree stating that the Jews were to be killed? We're going to find out about that now. So let's look at chapter, uh, verse 17 through 13. <clears throat> it says, then the king, then king of sources said to Queen Esther, And Mordecai the Jew. Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay hands on the Jews. You yourself write a decree, he's talking to Mordecai. You yourself write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. And that went as well with the decree that was written by Haman. So they couldn't revoke that as well. So the king's scribes were called at that time. In the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day, it, is writ- it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded. <clears throat> to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces. 
from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all. To every province it is in its own script, to every people in its own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of the king of Sources, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, <clears throat> to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. On one day, in all the province of King of Sources, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Ador, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people, so that the Jews would be ready on the day to avenge themselves on their enemies. <clears throat> so the king could not revoke the previous decree that he had put out, so he simply made another decree in support of the Jews as their attackers would come. So it wasn't like they were going to be lame ducks. They were going to be able to attack and protect themselves and do what they had to to survive. So the king said to Mordecai, you've got my signet ring. We can't reverse it. You decide what should happen for your people. And he gave them that responsibility. And the ball was now in Mordecai's court. And Mordecai's decree stated that the death would, uh, the death to the Jews was not going to happen. We're going to protect ourselves. And I think as any people, they should be protecting themselves. But we still must deal with that decree that was originally placed. I hope that's not my keys. <laughs> I don't think mine will reached that far. But anyway, we might think that Haman, all kind of stuff going on out there. We might think that Haman Give me a second to correct myself. I don't know who that is. Anyway, Haman being the enemy of the Jews, <clears throat> we have our own enemies. We have Satan who is our enemy. And sometimes we're our own worst enemy at times as well. But that decree had to stand. And they made the second decree. And I think about the first decree that God made. In Ezekiel 18, 4, it says, The soul who sins shall die. We have a first decree that's put against us. That the wages of sin is what? Death. In our sins, we not only have an enemy, Satan, but we also have a legal decree from God that is against us in humanity because of our sin. God, but God solved the problem by, by not compromising his decree in eternal justice but by fulfilling justice and taking the punishment we deserve. So that second decree came when Christ fulfilled the wages of death. That second decree is what freed us from the death that we deserve. So he had the first decree, which was to those who were sinned should die, but then he had the second decree that came from us through Christ on the cross. Romans 6.23 says, For the rages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He, his counter decree saves us. It says in Romans 3.26 that he might be justified, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. There was an urgency to get this second decree out to the nation to the provinces of the area, to ensure that the Jews were ready and they were equipped to be able to protect themselves. God never said that we were going to be able to walk through life with ease. We have to protect ourselves at times. And so we see the urgency of this word going out, and I believe as believers we need to have an urgency in getting that second decree out to the lost world that we're living in. Letting our family members and friends know that there is a way to be saved. There is a way to heaven. There is a way to be forgiven of the wrong that we do in our lives. And that's the second decree is through Jesus Christ. Amen.
verse 14, it says, The couriers who rode on the royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command. And the decree was issued in Shusan, the citadel. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white, with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province of the city, where, uh, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. God's purpose in all this matter goes further than just sparing the Jews. It went further than <clears throat> moving Mordecai to become the prime minister in Haman's place. There was a joy that came before the actual day that was appointed for the Jews to be annihilated. So they are joyful here in Sushan, the citadel. They are joyful in the city because of this new decree that came out and that day of reckoning had not even come yet. But yet they had this joy in them. Think about us. We, we may have some bad news and we may have to go see a doctor or we may have to have something coming up in our lives that we're just not sure about. But yet if you have that joy of the Lord in you, you can, you can rest a little easier. You can, you can face that trial a little bit easier because the joy of the Lord is in you. And so we see the Jews here joyful before that day of reckoning even came. And we should take... Uh, get hope and excitement about that. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, this, the second decree that the Jews had didn't keep them out of the heat of battle, didn't keep them out of trial, didn't keep them from possibly still being killed. But that second decree gave them hope, gave them uh, ability to be able to defend themselves, gave them a way out. And I think about this, the second decree now. Some Christian lives, for some reason, they're very blessed and they don't seem to have a trial in the world. That other believers, they have trials day in and day out, but they still have the joy of the Lord showing inside of them. That should bring us hope and get us excited for God. That that second decree that was put on the cross delivers us. It brings me excitement. I don't know. So the Lord doesn't promise to keep us from battle or difficulty, but he does promise to be with us and walk through it with us. Hebrews 13, 5 says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is walking with us, sometimes picking us up and carrying us through those trials. But he is with us. Like the psalmist said in, in Psalm 23, he says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I should fear no evil. We can't be scared of our own shadows. Or the shadows that are around us. Because we have a shepherd who walks through those valleys with us. So when the war is raging and the fire is burning. And we have storms all the way around us. We all discover that the Lord is with us in the most profound way. I just I don't love it when I go through trials. But when I do, when I feel the presence of the Lord there. It kind of brings a little more boldness to you. A little more comfort to you. And I love that feeling. Um, this kind of has to do with that, but just that feeling that the Lord is with you. I was listening to George's message in the book of Romans. Uh, I've been trying to do that every Wednesday morning as I drive to work. And there was a part that he said, and tears just came to my eyes. He said that, the, that we are the apple of God's eyes. Just knowing that no matter what trouble you're going through, no matter what battle, no matter what situation you're in, that, that God has an eye for you as a believer. And that should bring us comfort. In the same way, our course is not yet run. Our salvation is not yet complete, yet we can rejoice because of our confidence in our King. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We are not finished products. He is continuously working on each and every one of us. Some of us may still be on the assembly line, but that's all right. We, we, we're going to see a finished product one day. So 
as they saw God working on behalf of the people, you know, we're talking about the other people inside the province, not the Jews. So as they saw God working on behalf of his people, they wanted the same relationship with God. Verse 17, it says, And in every province and city, wherever the king commanded and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews. Are people seeing the joy and the excitement and the gladness that you have for being a child of God? That is the light that he's given us to show this world. That should attract those who are walking in darkness. Just like you have the little gnats that are attracted to the light when it's dark outside, the little June bugs. That light should attract them to us. That joy, that gladness should attract the people who are in darkness to us, not because of our own personalities, but because of Christ. And they see that in us. Even in the face of coming battles, there was joy and gladness, and many became Jews as a result. And why would the Lord have us go through battles and hard times? To be an example, to lead others to him. And one reason is for others to see the reality of who Jesus is. We, some of us, we're, sometimes we're the only Jesus people sees, and we're going to end on that. But we're the only Jesus some people see. They won't walk into a building like this to come hear the gospel. Some of them's been hurt by the church. Some of them's been hurt by family members and blame God for everything. But if you're walking in the light of Christ, we should be that example to them, the true light of who Christ is, and we should represent our King well. Amen? Amen. All right, Father, thank you for this word tonight, Lord. And let us be a great witness of who you are, Father God. Let our light shine in this dark and dying world that many like here who wanted to become Jews would want to become believers in you, Father. And that they would seek their salvation and their strength and their joy and their gladness from you and no other. Because this world can offer them nothing but death. But we know that you can offer eternal life. We thank you for that, Father. And we give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.